Where you stay? Okay. 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 There was a father Pablo Ramirez in the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> concept of superconducting fitness and how it applies to the odd, the dirty, and the driven. Thank you, Aline. Thank you, James, for the introduction. Thank you for the kind invitation. I know about this meeting for a long time. I uh, never managed to be here, so I'm glad uh, to participate this time and contribute to it. So yes, you can see the title of my talk that is uh, divided in three tales. Uh, but before I start, let me just mention that the overall uh, overarching uh, questions and things we are interested in my group are essentially what I would call complex quantum materials, which are materials that have multiple internal degrees of freedom that we have access to, what in the context of superconductivity usually means that they are available close enough to internal centers. And there are several examples that we um, thought about over the last years. Uh, we thought about strong ruthenate, which requires multiple orbital picture. We thought about doped topological insulators that require both the layer and the orbital degrees of freedom exclusively to have their phenomenology properly accounted for. Recently, we talked about also uh, serum ritual arsenic fuel, a very uh, interesting hyperparameter superconductor. And some of you heard my talk in Abingdon a few weeks ago on this topic. And last but not least, we also played with uh, von der Waals materials, in particular, this is by Leah Ruffin. And towards the end of the talk, we go towards flat bands, but with a very different key uh, take from what we did in this original uh, works. Very good. So, this all this work would not have happened without all these great collaborators. So um, I acknowledge here my theory collaborators on superconducting fitness and strong serotonin topics, uh, collaborators on the more computational side that provide the T calculations for the strong serotonin electronic structure in great detail as a function of strain, which was key for us to understand some important features of its phenomenology. The work on doped topological insulators uh, was inspired by experiments in a group of Yoshiendo in Cologne and pushed into more detail by a student at ETH, Bastian Zinka, who graduated last year. And last but not least, the driven will be covered by a work that was done in collaboration with Chitra Ramazamabranian, a senior scientist at ETH and her student, Raylin, who graduated just last month. Very good. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. So if you heard a talk by me over the last years, uh, you might have heard me talking about superconducting fitness one way or another. So in the first 10 minutes of this talk, I'd like to give you a heuristic understanding of where it comes from, which conceptually turns out to be quite simple, but seems to reflect in a lot of unconventional properties of unconventional superconductors. And that will manifest in this talk in three different ways. First, the odd, uh, the very 
puzzling scenario of strong salutamate has been more than three decades that we are not uh, yet uh, sure about the nature of the superconducting state in the system. And in this context, we used the superconducting fitness measures to stabilize, to find a mechanism to stabilize the prior losing wave superconductor. Uh, the case of the dirty concerns the business selenide materials. And the fitness measures allow us to understand how unconventional superconductors can be extremely robust in presence of disorders, uh, really going against our naive intuition that comes from a single band perspective. And the newest topic we have touched upon is the driven or periodically driven systems. And in particular, um, in the case of flat bands, it seems that we identified a pretty neat mechanism to enhance the superconducting critical advantage. Very good. So let's start with the notion of fitness. And I see that the audience is very broad. So we'll start with something very pedestrian, which is reminding ourselves that a superconductor comes out in the VCS sense out of a firm surface instability which is characterized by um, this psi of K, which includes some band dispersion and chemical potential. We have here some effective interaction, which in the simplest form takes um, forms pairs with opposite momentum and opposite spin. And this interaction is usually uh, active only within a short uh, range uh, in energy um, from the Fermi surface, which is characterized by some characteristic divide form of frequency. Uh, within, within superconductivity, mean field uh, theories do pretty well. So we can define a superconductor pair potential, which depends on how this interaction pairs the electrons and the development of an anomalous correlation function. Then our Hamiltonian then becomes essentially a non interacting problem that we can diagonalize and then explore what the phenomenology that it displays. So if you have taken a course on superconductivity, you might know how we get to an expression of this form. So just uh, solving this problem self-consistently, and we, we find what is known as the gap equation, taking the linearized version of this object, which has here two important features. One is this one over two epsilon, which comes from the, fa the fact that we are pairing electrons at opposite momentum. They are sitting at the first surface and the hyperbolic tangent that takes in um, temperature, the fact that this is uh, an equilibrium state. Now, if we invert this relation, we get an equation for TC, which is exponential in the um, V here, which is an effective interaction, which we take to be isotropic, what means that superconducting instability is the most robust instability there is because TC is finite, even for an arbitrarily small attractive interaction, different from other types of order in different channels. Very good. So BCS theory did wonderfully to explain conventional superconductors. But since the 50s, Anderson was already posing a very interesting question. So they, at the time, they know about uh, elemental materials and essentially avoids the word superconducting. And Anderson asked a very fair question. How is it possible that alloys that have mixed elements at a very high, high percentage that they're essentially dirty materials, uh, inhomogeneous materials, have a TC that is comparable to uh, clean elements. So to answer this question, uh, we have now what is known as Anderson's theorem, which says that the superconducting state is protected as soon as the symmetries associated with the states that you want to pair is not broken. So for the singlet states, that would be time reversal symmetry. So if I have a state with momentum K and spin up, I'm guaranteed to have a state with momentum minus k and spin down. So I can form a spin singlet pair. And if I'm interested in triplets, let's say with equal spin pairing, the key symmetry would be inversion that relates k up with minus k up. If we break explicitly the symmetries, be it by an external magnetic field or a rush but type spin orbit copy, what was originally a doubly degenerate band with the spin degeneracy becomes a split in essentially two different ways. But the consequence is always the same. I cannot form the pairs that I would like with opposite momentum and the spin configuration that I wish. So once we break the symmetry, then we cannot satisfy this optimal pairing condition that leads to the exponential form of ETC. So the superconducting stability is not robust anymore. So here we have some notion that the robustness of the superconducting stability should be associated with some kind of internal symmetry. 
Now, if we have complex superconductors, we have not only one band that is being degenerate, we usually have multiple bands, and these band themse bands themselves are formed by internal degrees of freedom, be it a layer, a spin, a sublattice, uh, it's going to be something else, but the principle is the same. So the message is that if I try to pair within the bands in this picture, I have a robust instability, but as soon as some of the pairing happens across the bands, then the superconducting instability is not so robust as it could be. So, okay, I'll show you some cartoons. Can we make these statements a bit more formal? Uh, yes, so let's write the mean field Hamiltonian in this BDG form. We'll be using uh, non-blue spinners with a particle and pulse sectors, and within each of them, I can add as many degrees of freedom uh, as I would like. So these objects here, H0 and delta, are themselves matrices. Here they would be 2n by 2n matrices. So in the, in the most general case, if I'm constructing my model based on my microscopic degrees of freedom, this Hamiltonian will not be diagonal. There is interorbital hopping, spin orbit coupling that connects these degrees of freedom. But this Hamiltonian uh, is a Hermitian matrix, so I can always diagonalize it and take it to uh, what I call uh, H not P <laughs> by a unitary transformation. For consistency, I need to transform also the whole sector, which will require me to transform the gap matrix to the band basis as well. Now, in case I have this optimal pairing condition, namely presence of both time reversal and inversion symmetry, uh, symmetries, this matrix in the band basis is not only diagonal, but is block diagonal with blocks proportional to the two by two identity, since we are bound to have a double degenerate spectrum. And if I have only intraband pairing in this basis, then my gap matrix in the band basis is also going to be block diagonal. So it's just a trivial mathematical fact that these two quantities commute with each other if I have what I call this optimal pairing condition. So this I found by going to the band basis because when we talk about superconductivity, we like to talk about it as an instability of a Fermi surface. But how does this condition reflect uh, in the original microscopic basis? Well, I can just rotate it back and what I get is not just a commutator, but a slightly modified commutator for the second term, I need to take the complex conjugate and uh, minus K. So if this condition in the microscopic basis is satisfied, I would say I have the perfect pairing condition. But in general, this condition is not satisfied. So I give it a label and a name. I call it FC, um, F from fitness, and C because this is, uh, has a structure of a commutator. <laughs> So if we push the calculations through with the standard magnetic field and rush plus spin orbit coupling, uh, what we find is this form for TC, which is universal in the sense that it tells me if I add anything to the Hamiltonian that gives me a finite FC, TC is going to go down. So for the singlet state, we know that is a magnetic field in any direction. For triplet states, that's going to be a rush plus spin orbit coupling in certain directions. But uh, the formula is quite general and also valid for larger structures. Not only the case of the single band that we know uh, very well, but also if I have extra degrees of freedom, then we can automatically know uh, What's, it's a, what's the effect of certain couplings in the normal state Hamiltonian on the superconducting um, physical propagation? Very good. So, yeah. Uh, it's not okay, independent. Oh, you uh, uh, and uh, yeah. Oh, I should have a, a, a more explicit brackets. Yeah, yes. It's an average over the things. Yes. yes. When you say TC is lowered, isn't there a possibility that there's a pairing interaction that would say favor in the band pairing? So when you say TC is lowered by this fitness, are you assuming that's about the pairing? Right. I assume it's not about the pairing. I assume this is a structural ingredient in the normal state Hamiltonian. That's right. So what I had in mind originally here was external symmetry breaking fields that can act uh, in a detrimental way or not, depending on their nature. But one can generalize this idea and think about how one can tune intrinsic terms that are there in the normal state Hamiltonian that 
could lead to changes in coupling, but if we uh, neglect those, we still have this uh, intrinsic piece of the story, which would uh, keep its effect. Yeah. Very good. Um, so let's start with the first tale, uh, given the introduction of this quantity, and this is the tale about something that is odd or was thought to be odd for a long time. So strong serotonin was thought to be the best example of a chiral P wave superconductor for a long time. But uh, over the last uh, two or three years, uh, it became very clear that this is unfortunately not the case. And uh, that we can conclude primarily from this recent uh, NMR experiments that show here the night shift as a function of field, but also uh, temperature. And uh, it seems to track quite well what would ex be expected by the um, magnetic field dependence of the specific heat. And most importantly, the night shift is always suppressed as a function of temperature um, once we are below Tc, which suggests that we have a spin singlet superconductor. In addition to that, there is also um, recent experiments with ultrasound attenuation which shows a discontinuity in the shear modular, what's called your C66 U2G symmetry, which indicates that the superconducting order parameter can couple to a non-trivial phonon uh, mode. And this is only possible if the superconducting order parameter itself has two components or belongs to a reducible representation that is larger than one dimensional. Therefore, here, the label goes to component. A uh, third piece of evidence um, that remains and was revisited recently is the apparent time reversal symmetry breaking uh, that is observed below the superconducting critical temperature if we take the system without applying strain. Namely, TC and the time reversal symmetry breaking, they appear at the same temperature. But once uniaxial strain is applied and we break the C4 symmetry of the system, which relates X and Y components, we see that these two temperatures become different, what suggests that there was some symmetry protection to these two components that was making the chiral state develop um, as soon as superconductivity developed, uh, that is broken only if I break this D4 symmetry. So this gives us evidence that the two components in the superconducting order parameter are not arbitrary, but are symmetry related. So putting these three pieces of evidence together, uh, we have a good indication that strong serotonate is still chiral, but now it should be a chiral uh, superconductor in the odd even parity sector in a singlet state, which suggests that it's some kind of chiral D wave state. And given the point group symmetry of this um, superconductor, that would be essentially a Kx plus or minus Iky with an overall Kz. Uh, now, this order parameter has not been considered at all as a good contender because the Fermi surfaces of the system are highly cylindrical. They are highly two-dimensional. And this order parameter here has a KZ modulation, which looks rather unnatural. So once people started considering this order parameter, the first question is, how on earth can we stabilize this? There, if there is not even uh, hopping between the layers, why would there be interactions? Yes. Can you remind me about the what's the answer about nodes? It's very clear. It, very clearly, it, it has nodes. There is thermal conductivity that shows that it's most likely vertical. There are more, most likely vertical line nodes. Um, fitting to temperature dependence of specific heat suggests horizontal line nodes. Uh, QPI suggests something like a VX square minus Y square structure. Um, so for sure, there are nodes. For sure, it's unconventional. What was already known because this this material is extremely sensitive to disorder. TC <coughs> is killed by very, very, very small amounts of disorder. Uh, so it's definitely unconventional and, and novel. Question. Yes. Uh, the night shift is present, but it is not necessarily complete 100%. And so that doesn't 100% rule out a Um, I think 100% uh, 
you might come up with a theory that uh, would do that in the triplet sector, but I think there are different directions of magnetic field that were checked, and they both consistently see a large reduction of the night shift, and that makes it harder to come up with a consistent I picture guess we'll of, know, so in the triplet sector. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's right. Fine. Um, very good. So, um, how does this fit in what I just told you uh, in the beginning of the talk? Well, to describe the normal state, we are going to need not only the spin that we have freedom, but also three orbitals in the TQG sector DXZ, DYZ, and DXY. And we are going to encode the normal state Hamiltonian as a matrix in terms of three by three gamma matrices and two by two Pauli matrices, accompanied by the appropriate form factor. And we can make a group theory exercise, and then we can um, pinpoint where the pairs of A and B indexes, which are symmetry allowed. In presence, we, in principle, we have nine times four, uh, 36 different matrices and basis functions. But uh, in presence of time reversal and inversion symmetry, these are constrained only to 15, which are listed here. So these are the A and B uh, indexes. And on the last column, you see the type or the physical processes they are associated with. That could be uh, stemming from intra-orbital hopping. So everything that is hopping has a zero, has B index equals to zero, and everything that has B index one to three is some kind of spin orbit coupling, be it atomic or momentum dependent. And uh, if we diagonalize this matrix with the appropriate AJB functions, we get uh, these uh, three Fermi surfaces labeled as A, beta, gamma, Alpha, beta, gamma, sorry, uh, which makes uh, also clear that the Fermi surfaces have a rather non trivial texture of the orbital degrees of freedom around them. So, out of these uh, 15 terms, there are essentially 12 physical processes, and up to the orders we kept, there are essentially 26 fitting parameters that we uh, fit to the best DFT calculations we um, have available. So, this exercise is done for the normal state. And for the uh, superconducting state, we can do a similar exercise. Now, in this orbital basis, in this microscopic basis, we can enumerate all the even momentum um, order parameters in terms of its how the pairs are formed across the orbitals and across the spins. And if you are interested in order parameters that could be higher D wave, we are interested in this sector highlighted in blue here which is the EG sector with two components and even parity. Very good. Now, if I make a quick inspection, just checking which matrices commute with which, I can get already some um, good guidelines. I learned, for example, that atomic spin orbit coupling always leads to an FC not equal to zero for order parameters in the sector, but that these uh, three terms at the bottom be it interorbital hopping at uh, higher orders or momentum dependent spin orbit coupling leads to a zero um, FC uh, measurement. So then I have uh, uh, two guidelines that if I would be interested in stabilizing this type of order parameter, I'd like to tune my system such that I reduce atomic spin orbit coupling and enhance this momentum dependent spin orbit coupling terms, which importantly, are not only momentum dependence, but necessarily have a KZ dependence, something that is usually thrown away in the simplest forms of this model. Very good. So we fit, uh, we fix our, our 26 uh, parameters, and we get a Fermi surface projected to the KZ equals zero plane that looks like the Bordeaux Fermi surface that you see here, and the thickness corresponds to the corrugation along the Z axis. Now, if we assume a simple Hubbard Kanamori Hamiltonian only with local interactions, such that in this orbital basis, there is no explicit momentum dependent in my uh, gap, what I find is that an order parameter that um, is minimized uh, in the A1G sector. So, in terms of symmetries, is a rather boring uh, symmetry channel. But if I follow the specific direction on this 26 dimensional, uh, phase space, uh, this direction that the fitness criteria uh, suggested us, 
I actually find a whole region in parameter space not far from this point that DFT suggests suggests us uh, to describe the normal state. We find a point in which, uh, well, a whole region in which an um, order parameter with EG symmetry is stabilized. So this was uh, reassuring that uh, we did the explicit exercise and we found uh, what we wanted. And uh, this is also um, suggested that if we know how to tune the normal states, if we want, want to apply pressure or different types of strain or apply or grow your material with different atoms such that the electronic structure is tuned in a very specific way, we have good guidelines to enhance the critical temperature in superconductors in general. Very good. Uh, this was the message of the first tale. Yes. So, so yeah, uh, I assume so there were uh, three different PT states. Yes. One of them was a single. I assume you're thinking about the singer, is that right? Uh, well, it will come out as a superposition of all. All three of them. But the one that dominates, in fact, is this one 5, 3, 6. Yeah. Now, if I look at the gamma matrices with these indexes, 5 and 6 in our notation are the most standard notation, they always correspond to. Anti-symmetric interorbital pairing, um, and uh, they have this uh, apparent triplet component. But of course, since it, the, since this is in the EG sector, once you rotate it to the band basis, it's a well-behaved uh, spin single in the band basis. You don't see the nitrous; nice. it looks like it's in the if it's, yes. If it's in the yes. And actually, yes, so the fact that it is dominated by this term, it also suggests that actually this is the term that actually has the strongest effect on the stability. So as soon as it's turn, turned on, then <laughs> this state becomes stable. So this uh, 5, 6 spin orbit coupling term is the normal state spin orbit coupling term that I have that as long as it's not zero, I can never stabilize the region state. But once it becomes finite, um, then the texture of the orbitals around the Fermi surface is such that it allows for this type of pairing. Mm -hmm. Just one question yes. about that phase diagram as well. Does that mean some very small modification to it, like pressure or something, might actually make it into a triplet superconductor? Uh, yes and no. So the yes, yes. Yeah, so maybe I didn't point it out explicitly, but there are also the blue pattern here. This is the Fermi surface generated by the parameters associated okay. with the blue point. So they're still very close to reality and very yeah. close to what DFT suggests. Uh, now note that this is in the even parity sector, so it's a spin single in state. Even though okay. in the microscopic yeah. basis, yes, yes, exactly. So it's EG, so if the Okay. What a right way to think about it is that it's effectively as a single state. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so then uh, with this message, let me move on to the second tale. And that concerns uh, materials in the family of uh, bismuth 2, selenium 3, which are known to be topological insulators. And when doped, they become superconductors and apparently also topological superconductors. And structurally, uh, the minimal units are this uh, bismuth 2, selenium 3 pentapolar years uh, that reflect on the degrees of freedom at the Fermi surface in the following way. So, the main uh, electronic degrees of freedom come from PZ orbitals at the selenium, at the most external selenium and bismuth atoms. And uh, from first, principle, first principles calculations, uh, we know that there are two different uh, PZ like orbitals with different parity. What I mean by that, uh, not, it's not a contradiction on itself. It means that I combine the PZs on the top and the bottom layers in a symmetric or in an anti symmetric way. Now we can do the same uh, exercise to construct the normal state Hamiltonian to get some kind of K.P theory for uh, your bismuth selenide. And we can go over the same story to write down the order parameter in terms of these matrices in the microscopic basis. Here we use tall because we have just two effective orbitals close to the Fermi surface. And uh, we can enumerate again what are the even, or even uh, momentum dependent order parameters. 
uh, highlighting here the interesting ones for this case in blue, because these are going to be odd parity. Um, and according to uh, Fu and Berg, uh, automatically topological in this case. But the drawback is that uh, odd parity is usually associated with nodes, and nodes is usually associated with uh, fragility of the superconducting state in the presence of impurities. Now, um, one material in this family, which uh, Yoshiando was measuring uh, a few years ago, is an uh, intercalated version of this bismuth selenide. It's called the uh, CPSBS. And in specific heat, they see that uh, it doesn't seem to quite follow the BCS prediction. And thermal transport seems to extrapolate at low temperatures to something finite with a quadratic temperature dependence, which suggests the presence of point nodes. Another material in this family, niobium doped bismuth selenide, when proton irradiated, uh, seems to show uh, quite remarkable robustness in presence of this uh, of impurities induced by the irradiation, which uh, is reflected on how TC depends on the residual um, resistivity. So I have a sample, I irradiate it, I create defects. And my residual resistivity changes substantially, but TC is quite robust. What you see in green here is a curve that is 100 times um, what would ex be expected from the simplest abrikosa borkov type of calculation. So something weird is happening here. So for the ones who are not following, the cartoon is the following. Uh, we have a nodal superconductor with an order parameter that changes sign in some direction in the thermal surface. And we can think about impurities as a self-averaging process. Now, if the scattering rate is larger than the magnitude of the gap itself, the self-averaging process will have the effect of reducing um, the gap magnitude in an effective way up to the point where it becomes larger than the gap itself above and above this point, we would not expect any gap at all. So we would not expect the superconductor to exist. This material, CPSBS, seems to be on an extreme version of this because the evaluated scattering rate is about 30 MeV and the gap is about 0.5 MeV. So the scattering rate seems to be on two orders of magnitude than the gap. So why is this superconductor there at all? So in order to understand that, we did something very simple. We carried all these matrix structures to the standard calculations we know from because of work. We opened the book and we kept track of things that go beyond the numbers. Right? So we just treated impurities um, at the Born approximation. We later checked that it goes it is, is valid even beyond the Born approximation. We treated uh, scattering and impurities through a self-energy of this form with a matrix here for the impurity potential in the full BDG form with its particle and whole components. And we push this following the book. And what we find is that in this context, we can define a renormalized frequency and a renormalized gap. Now, what is important to define TC is essentially a ratio of omega over delta. And you see that if this term is not there, omega and delta, they are renormalized exactly in the same way. Only if this uh, FV function, average over the Fermi surface and average over impurities is not zero, we get uh, uh, a different renormalization for these two components. And this FV, I purposefully uh, labeled it with F as fitness again, but now instead of the normal state Hamiltonian, we have the fitness uh, for the scattering potential itself. So it appears exactly in the same way, telling us that this uh, unfolding the electronic structure of these complex materials in terms of its internal degrees of freedom pays off because we can understand now phenomenology that was not possible before. So what we find then if we push this uh, textbook calculation further is that the corrected TC is given in terms of the clean TC as a function of these diagonal functions and an effective scattering rate, which again appears as the average of this FV quantity. So in this context, then we can say that we have a generalized version of Anderson's theorem, 
which is uh, encodes the symmetry necessary to guarantee the robustness of the superconducting state now in the form of a commutator itself. And uh, in this work of, uh, pushed by Bastian Zinko, a student that worked with me at ETH, we could uh, investigate further what's the effect of the location of these impurities to try to get a handle on that, because this is, seems to be also a discussion in the field. We tried to look at the effects of on site impurities, intercalating impurities, and interstitial impurities between these principal layers to see the effect of TC. And given the different parity of these orbitals at the Fermi surface, we learned that it was interesting to separate the scattering potential in components that are even or odd. So if I have just one impurity in one of the layers here, it's a superposition of an impurity here with a plus plus potential and another set of impurities with a plus minus potential. So it's a superposition of uh, even and odd components. And interestingly, the evolution of this symmetric and anti-symmetric components of the scattering potential as a function of doping is quite different. The more impurities I have, the less contribution to the anti-symmetric components I have. And conversely, the more uh, the strongest contribution to the symmetric component. So if we evaluate TC um, as a function of uh, impurity density, we find that in the limit of uh, optimal pairing potential for the clean system, there can be quite dramatic effects if the uh, superconducting fitness function picks up only this anti-symmetric component of the scattering potential. Instead of TC dropping um, like this, it acquires uh, this other uh, qualitatively different behavior because now the anti-symmetric component uh, of the potential is reduced as one introduces more and more impurities. Very good. So the second message is that the superconducting fitness measure also manifested now in a slightly different way once we talk about um, impurities in complex uh, superconductors. Now, the third tale uh, concerns what I call the driven. Uh, and this was not motivated by any materials, was out of curiosity to investigate how these structures also manifest themselves in the time domain. So roughly speaking, I will put the theories that are out there concerning enhancing superconductivity or the superconducting transition temperature in two boxes. There are theories that based essentially on the process of dynamical localization. You apply some laser radiation, it couples uh, through minimal coupling to your electrons. And what you have effectively, if this is a periodic function of time, is that your hopping amplitudes get renormalized by a vessel function, what means that hopping is always smaller than what it was for a given um, vector potential in amplitude. Uh, so this then, as we know what we are going to get if we do this exercise, uh, the bandwidth is reduced, the density of states is enlarged, so no surprise, uh, TC is probably going to be enhanced. Uh, another pathway consists of uh, phonon driving, and then we have an effective renormalization of the electron phonon coupling, which is treated essentially within an aesthetic approach once you understood how this electron phonon coupling could be enhanced. Uh, very good. Uh, what I'll try to show you today is uh, something that is different from these two approaches, and I hope that by the end of the talk, um, that's clear. And if it's not, uh, please um, ask me and I'll try to clarify. So what we have here is a periodic uh, Hamiltonian in time, which can be decomposed in its uh, Fourier modes. And uh, that is what we call the Fourier representation with H and the modes. They can be put on a matrix, um, which is very redundant on the left side. You see that all the diagonal elements are the same. So why would I do that? I'm not gaining anything with it. And the problem is still effectively time dependent. I just put the time dependence on an exponential. Now, there is this converse uh, representation, which is called the Glockier representation that picks up the frequencies only in the diagonal as a shift 
in energy by omega, by the drive frequency of um, your spectra, essentially. And the off-diagonal terms, again, they are still all the same and provide the interconnection between these different sectors at uh, different um, energy shifts. What I gain by working on the right side is that I have an effectively time-independent Hamiltonian that I'm more comfortable to deal with. Now, what are we going to look uh, at today concerns um, a drive that will drive just the electronic part of my system. Uh, there's going to be a VAF, and there's going to be some um, system VAF coupling. Now, a priori, I'm driving only the system, and you can say, oh, you can just find some rotating frame and just treat it in this uh, uh, effectively static mode. But here, we don't drive the bath. So if we rotate out the time dependence of the system, it will fall out in the bath, and then the bath will look non-thermal. So there's really no way I can get away from the time dependence in the system. So without going much into details, what we do is to follow this Floquet structure. Now my Green's functions, my Hamiltonians, everything is worked out in this bigger matrix space that encodes now the shifted um, sectors in energy. And as an ansatz, I will use a gap that is also decomposed in Fourier modes that can be also encoded in terms of Green's functions and correlation functions in this bigger matrix Floquet space. Now, uh, this equation looks like the equations I showed you before. I have some gap, some self-consistency condition that now runs over all uh, Floquet sectors. These hashed matrices are in Floquet space. But let's say I'm interested in just one specific mode. I can project it out. And then my gap function looks something like I've seen before. I have here the trace over the degrees of freedom of my retarded Green's function projected in the uh, off diagonal sector of my Bolognese Hamiltonian and the spin singlet sector here, for example. But this TL is not the good old hyperbolic tangent. The thermal distribution is a weird object. Uh, so for the L equals zero, it's just the hyperbolic tangent, but for higher Ls, is some deformed uh, hyperbolic tangent with its um, discontinuity in the t equals zero limit that matches essentially the um, uh, half uh, omega over two omega and so on. So these are sitting essentially at the edge of the temporal Brillouin zone or at the uh, center of the next Brillouin zone. So these functions uh, are telling us they're going to pick up contributions that are a function of, tem of temperature that will come from different uh, brilliant zones in time, yeah. different regions of this periodic structure in frequency. Very good. So now let me show you some uh, cartoons of how what happens to these structures as we plot them in terms of um, spectral functions, like the electron, the particle hole spectrum function, particle particle spectrum function, and the response function for the superconducting uh, channel. So if I don't have any drive, let's say I have just a single energy level, I will have a pole concerning my <laughs> electronic side and a pole concerning <laughs> my whole side of the story just by construction because I'm working in this BDG kind of basis. Now, for the anomalous spectral function, I have essentially this form, but uh, anti-symmetrized and renormalized. So there is not much um, uh, why my equations are not showing. I don't know. Um, my equations are not here. Um, no, that's all I wanted to say, actually, no. Yes. Um, and what I want to say now is that this last um, object, the response function itself, will depend on temperature, and the poles are going to be uh, reduced under strength for higher temperatures, which reflect essentially on the fact that the superconducting order parameter is being reduced as a function of temperature. Now, let me drive the system periodically, and we start to see some structure. So 
if I drive with frequency omega, I can think about this uh, Brillouin zones in time that go from minus omega over two to omega over two. And we see that the poles, uh, the position of the poles is repeated in this following Brillouin zones, but the amplitude of these poles um, is reduced and is reduced in, in this figure in a specific way as a power of A, which is the amplitude of my drive and capital omega, which is the frequency of the drive. So here I'm working essentially perturbatively on A over omega. So it's a weak drive. Uh, so this structure reflects also in this anomalous spectral function. But um, interestingly, um, also in the response function, but now the response function doesn't have only this factor, it has this factor of psi here. And this factor of psi comes out of a structure that resembles this fitness function now between the gap structure and the first uh, Fourier mode of my system, which is usually could be chosen to be the unique Fourier mode if my drive is sinusoidal. So if this psi is chosen to be plus one, it means that the commutator between these two objects is zero. And then the structure that I have from one Brillouin zone to the next won't acquire any extra minus sign. But if this psi is minus one, namely the anti-commutator between these two objects is zero, then there is going to be some staggered structure that appear in, in frequency space as I go out to the next um, frequency Brillouin zones. And this is illustrated here. So I can choose different drives. I'm not telling yet what they are. I can choose that drives that are unfit or drives that are fit in this sense. And if you're following and you are confused, um, there is some subtlety between the notation that we use for different papers. One is in particle basis, the other one is in number basis, but all is uh, means the same. So if you're following the talk from the beginning, what I meant here is that Fc is not zero, the drive is unfit. Fc equals to zero, the drive is fit. If the drive is unfit, uh, we see that this anomalous uh, spectral function uh, just repeats itself and is renormalized in the next Brillouin zone. While if it's a fit drive, it repeats itself, but it flips sign as you go to the next Brillouin zone. So we say that it has the same phase, the, essentially the order parameter has quote unquote the same phase, or it uh, acquires a pi phase shift as you go to the next Brillouin zone in this picture. Now, this green background means something that I haven't explained, and it means a chosen cutoff. Here we chose a cutoff that is a hard cutoff in the sense of the VCS theory. Uh, this could be weakened, but for the sake of a uh, first example, we chose the simplest thing we could do even to get an analytical handling. So the green region that you see as background defines a cutoff in energy for my pairing, which uh, if chosen to be within this region would only capture pairing within this reduced um, uh, poles. So it will tell me that essentially if I start here and I drive the system, even for the fit drive, uh, the order parameter would be reduced. Um, but if I choose the pole, the, the cutoff such that it includes the next pole here, its pole will now add up to the central pole in a constructive manner. In contrast to the unfit drive, uh, because now the next pole that comes in comes in with an opposite sign, so it will add uh, destructively towards superconductivity once you take the integral uh, in frequency. So as the simplest example we took, because we wanted to put, push this uh, analytically in the simplest form as possible, we took a flat band a filling, so there is actually no dispersion. Uh, and the drive we took to be sinusoidal, so for just the first plus minus one Fourier components are finite. And in principle, it could be in any channel here, tall is in number space and sigma is in spin space. And for the simplicity of the problem, we also chose a spin singlet superconductor with the sigma y here, which is momentum independent. 
So if we do this calculation, we find that if we drive the system with an unfit drive, no surprise, I know that this pose, even the central pole is renormalized down. The next pose acts destructively in the sense of an, in the sense of an interference pattern. So the order parameter at zero temperature is reduced. And TC is always reduced. So I just renormalize the entire problem, which is something that is uh, bad for superconductivity, both TC and the delta are reduced. But if I drive with a fit drive, for example, I put the, just a rush bus in orbit coupling, I break inversion symmetry, but I preserve time reversal symmetry in the sense of Anderson's theorem. What I find is that the um, gap magnitude is almost not corrected. And then something interesting happens. Um, there is this tail that appears because now the larger the temperature, the more of this higher um, frequency pulse I can integrate in. So TC does not die where it should die or as, as I would expect it to die um, in equilibrium, but acquires this tail, which in this limit, which is quite extreme uh, of the flat band, allows TC to be actually arbitrarily larger than the equilibrium value given the right choice of um, drive frequency and cutoff. And uh, this can be shown here. So this tail, um, t the critical temperature that follows this tail essentially follows uh, the ratio of the amplitude, the drive amplitude over the frequency squared times the second factor, which has here delta omega, which is how detuned from the uh, frequency, the drive of the frequency is this cutoff now that I'm choosing. So if I choose the cutoff and the frequency to match each other um, almost perfectly, uh, this factor can be uh, arbitrarily large. Now you might ask, okay, is this a bug out of the flat band system or does it survive if I add some dispersion? Yes, we did the exercise for the dispersion. The formula is not so neat, but within the approximations we could make um, for uh, equilibrium TC of a dispersive system, this TC gets corrected in the following form. Uh, there is a ratio of the original TC over omega, which is generally already a very large number to the sixth power. And then there is this factor again, <laughs> capital omega over delta omega, <laughs> which is the same as here which could be um, a small number, um, I'm sorry, a, a large number, um, because delta omega can be chosen to be very small. But then we have this factor, this power here, which is again, a small number. So it kind of kills or washes away a bit the effect. Qualitatively, we still have the enhancement, but it's effect at least for the example we followed with a dry A over omega of about 0.2. You see that here we could see uh, enhancement of uh, TC for very large numbers here, at least a factor of two, but here is a, a, a factor of 20% um, or less. So it gets washed away, but the structures are still there. Um, very good. So with yeah. that, um, I would like to wrap up. Uh, emphasizing again that this story about fitness is something rather trivial conceptually, but uh, we have found it that it manifests in so many non-trivial ways. And there are observables and phenomenologies that we can now understand uh, because uh, this is, we, we broke down these structures within the equations that we already know for a long time. Right? So it is a measure that is useful to understand superconductors with multiple internal degrees of freedom and uh, allows for a faithful discussion of uh, symmetries at the global level in terms of EREPs, but also internally uh, how the degrees of freedom play with each other to give something on the right symmetry channel. So this all can be unfolded in terms of this uh, framework. It allows us to understand the effects of symmetry breaking fields, in different types of impurities, and also allows us to think about engineering electronic states or electronic structures to sustain uh, desirable superconducting states. I don't know why it's not uh, playing anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, I told you about uh, three cases today. 
but there are many other uh, realizations of uh, manifestations of these structures that I have not uh, told you about. So different groups picked up on this story in different ways. So uh, non-zero fitness is also a measure of the presence of odd frequency correlations, and Balatsk is not here to say great. Um, there is also association with uh, finite anomalous tau response in Cairo superconductors, uh, opening of finite energy gaps in non-linear superconductors, and also the presence of a symmetric volume spectra in PG symmetric superconductors, which is associated with phenomenology such as piezoelectric effect, nonlinear optical responses, non-reciprocal Meissner. So. Um, uh, just to emphasize one more time, this is really a measure of unconventional properties and unconventional superconductors. And as an outlook of this new uh, endeavor uh, on the driven systems, um, there are, of course, things that we have not explored and, to be honest, mm -hmm. not thought enough about on how to deal with heating. If we go to a faithfully interacting system beyond the mean field theory, what should I do to see if this survives? <laughs> if I get not addressed that. Um, but one thing that we are pretty sure we can address uh, that, as I have shown you, we have just explored in the context of a simple superconductor, just with the spin degree of freedom, is what if we really get one of these complex superconductors that are out there? And what kind of drives can we tailor? What kind of phonons should we excite to periodically drive the correct parameters in the Hamiltonian to lead to the enhancement, potential enhancement of this? Now, in terms of feasibility, I think we have good indications. So, Floke bands have been seen in prismic selenide itself. Um, there is a signature of Floke topological band structures in graphene by circularly polarized light. So Floke structures do exist and they are measurable. And uh, well, maybe more nicely, in the direction of the extreme cases that we identified, the notion of flat bands now seems to be spilling out of twisted two-dimensional systems to also three-dimensional systems with this nice work enumerating different classes of materials in the Kagome, Paracor, lead lattice, and so on, that seems to sustain flat bands very, very close to the Fermi surface that would be very interesting um, platforms for this proposal. So with that, I would like to finish and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Uh, I have a question about the uh, generalized energy theory. Yes. Uh, I was surprised actually uh, that uh, the extra term is only proportional to the state of the mm -hmm. So, this is a statement within the uh, second to one approximation, or is there um, any some further approximation? Yeah, there is one layer of approximation. The conclusion is to valid. Um, so, this closed form equation with only the FB is valid, assuming that the clean system is fit itself. It is not for itself. This argument is weakened slightly, but the trends are the same. It's not a deep summary you will know, invert the global increase in the is there. And the twin system, the system is fixed, and then uh, it will start being beneficial with the system that is not uh, that will not happen. But the statement is weakened. It's not going to be absolutely robust if FB equals to zero, but it's interfered with the planet FC will lead to some reduction. Mm -hmm. Another question. I have a question. Um, shortly before HITC, uh, Anderson proposed that uh, that uh, triplet superconductors uh, would advantageously be able to take care of Hood's coupling if they have had a center of symmetry away from their sides. Does superconducting fitness enable one to understand Anderson's? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, in principle, yes, because uh, if you have now a two sub, you have a sub lattice structure, right? So your inter extra internal degree of freedom in that case is not an orbital, it's a sub lattice or a layer structure. As it is seen in serum rhodium to arsenic tube, you're running the telluride. I think it's not a coincidence that the superconductors that are probably the best candidates to be a triplet superconductor actually carry internal structures that allow for 
this twist of the order parameter now in the layer or sub lattice sector that was not possible before. If you have just a single sub lattice, then if you have sparing the single state, that's all it is. But now, if you can play with the anti-symmetrization of the um, of the pair um, of the of the pair with respect to the layers, then you have something more. But then I didn't touch it in the fitness function. Of course, we can do the exercise, and to some extent, Daniel Achterberg did a little bit of this recently for Renu de Telluri. So essentially, the same kind of exercise with the layer degree of freedom, and one can discuss, yeah, what are the strongest instabilities, or what different types of fields in different directions would do. Uh, and in the case, I think of Renu de Telluri, this is very interesting because the phase diagram is very rich. There are multiple superconducting phases, and we could understand how some of them get boosted or weakened from this perspective. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Okay. Well, any more questions? Well, that then, oh, yes, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is an ill-formed question, so forgive me. <laughs> yes. um, I, I was trying to think whether in the case where F B is almost zero and the movement is actually zero, and the case where I have point five is zero, yeah. Is there some, do I go into some kind of green space of paper, which I can think about this type of superconductivity? Yes, you can. Uh, so in a way, it uh, could be seen a simple way. If we think about a superconductor that it has nodes, it means that the gap changes sign across different directions, and that will manifest also in real space. Now, if you put an impurity at some place, it will essentially break some of the bonds in this extended picture so the breaking of the bonds is detrimental to superconductivity while if you have something with uh, that is primarily local um, that is s wave like even in this uh, orbital basis even if in the band basis it picks up momentum dependence as long as in the orbital basis in the local picture it's momentum independent then it would uh, become more robust so this is at the core of all this yeah yeah, yeah, this picture is, is a good picture. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I also have a very informed question. Yeah. Um, so, I'm trying to understand the logic of sponging movement, the argument you made. Yeah. Uh, so, the way I understood it is the fact they see sponging movement being a superconductor means that it must be fit. It must be. Uh, well, well, let me just explain the okay. way I think maybe yes. it's the video on it. Um, yes. And the fact that this fit allows you to motivate this KZ uh, PX plus IP or I be part of time. So was that the logic or was it something else? No, it was something else. Okay. So I think uh, source of the is not as fit as it can be. Uh, and that is manifested primarily by Z-axis compressive strain that seems to enhance its critical temperature at the same time that the density of state goes down. So if I follow just the, like, the band pairing perspective, I would expect to see to go down. But there is something that changes when the orbital distribution around the Fermi surface that becomes much more effective if I apply safety strain. So this is one example of, and then we have a good story to, to say that that's probably close to true. So we have first principles backing up that. So which parameters in the normal state when the linear change? That compensate the reduction of the density of states yeah. through the so texture. There's no relation to this other parameter structure that you propose to easy. There is, no. and it only manifests for that specific host parameter. So it's a round story. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a very round story. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, the right uh, general Achilles in theorem, you said he also went beyond bonds, as I mentioned, this means that from the team matrix. So, uh, right yes, now. team matrix, yeah. And yeah. The, the results were almost the same? Uh, the conclusion is the same. So, we can do it very easily if absolutely is equal to zero. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but if it's not, then yeah, it becomes a bit more <laughs> Okay, well, that doesn't quite. Finish today's activities. So if you want to join us at Jack Horner on the corner, that's where we often go after the last lecture. But that's thank you, Thank you very much. We will begin again tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning.